There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so the title is wrong. Um, the I have to update the title. In fact, let me see um, if I can do that now. Um, yeah, so sorry. The, the title um, of the stream says CS 101 23 March. Um, I have to um change that it defaults to whatever i used last so uh okay it looks like uh looks like we're up and running um so we'll uh we'll just get to it then so how are you guys doing this morning looks like we got uh, almost everybody here um we've got uh looks like eight of you uh okay uh, is audio coming through okay? Looks like you can see the screen. Um, just, uh, uh, Willie, if you could type in chat if that is both coming through okay, both audio and video. Okay. All right, looks like we're good to go then. So my dog is very displeased. I've locked her out of the office so that she won't bark at me the whole time. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to start uh, with uh, a common question that I got uh, from a few of you yesterday just to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, and so it was with one of the, uh, the implicit differentiation problems. Um, uh, let me just make up one for sake of quick example here. Um, let's say that we had um, uh, something like this. Okay, then the derivative, uh, we would have 2x plus 2y dy dx equals 0. Um, and then one of the problems uh, in the, the implicit differentiation homework asked for, what's the second derivative? Okay, so the second derivative... is notated like that, d squared y over dx squared. That's just tradition, so. Um, well, what is the second derivative? It's the derivative of the derivative. So a bunch of you said, okay, well, I'll just take the derivative of that expression. So I'd get 2, in this case, 2 plus 2y times d squared y over dx squared plus 2 dy dx times dy dx. Okay, so the reason that this turned into those two terms, oh, and it's still equal to zero. Um, the reason that that turned into those two terms was the um, product rule. Okay, um, so we've got the product rule there. Um, okay, so any questions on how I got to that point, just using the product rule? Does that make sense? We good? Um, okay, so uh, yeah. Now at this point then, what was the goal? We wanted to find the second derivative so we could solve for it algebraically. And in this case, we would get dy or d squared y over dx squared is minus 2 minus 2 dy dx squared um, all over 2y. Okay, so I just solve for the second derivative like normal, uh, or just like I would solve for the first derivative. It's just algebra at this point. And uh, so a lot of you guys got stuck here. Okay, so the question is, why aren't we actually stuck? And the reason is, do we know what dy dx is?
Okay, we know what it is because, um, let me pick a different color here. If we take our first derivative equation, this tells us that dy dx is negative 2x over 2y, or just negative x over y. So we can substitute that in here. And so in fact, we have All right, and the dog's going nuts. Hang on one second. Uh, I'm going to mute my audio for a second. If I can find the damn button. Okay, sorry about that. Um, she has been banished from the office. Uh, okay, so um, does that make sense, right? So we, uh, we had a formula for dy dx from before, and so uh, all we have to do is um, just substitute that back in, and that means that our final answer here is like before, still just in terms of x and y. There's no dy dx in it or y prime or anything like that. Okay, so there was that just one extra step um, to, to substitute in. Um, okay, good. So um, just wanted to make sure that was good. Uh, were there any other questions that I could dispense with uh, here real quick or... Um, And I'm sorry about the dog barking. Okay, Willie, you're good. All right, if anybody else has another question, just uh, please type in the chat that you have a question or uh, speak in the... Uh, the Discord part. All right, Nate, you're good. All right, well, let's just keep on rolling then. So, um, okay. So the um, the second thing, uh, or what I wanted to kind of start talking about today, and this will probably take us uh, uh, a couple of days, um, is uh, we'll start talking about optimization. So. Um, to start with this, let's actually go backwards a little bit. Um, and let's start talking or remind ourselves about a couple of uh, concepts. So quick review. Um, the first is the limit definition definition of continuity okay so what it what did it mean for a function to be continuous so f of x is continuous at x equals a means that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a okay and uh, when we wrote this uh, in class um, this really meant it meant a bunch it meant that um, f of a existed or sorry was defined uh, it meant that the limit actually existed and it meant that uh, the two the two things actually equaled each other okay so just quick re recap of that um, okay so um, we could I'm gonna have to move on to uh, the the next sheet here to, to have room uh, we good with the definition of continuity um, 
oh, and, and sorry, I'll add one other thing uh, here, uh, namely, Let me say it this way. Um, um, so then the the other thing is so continuity. Uh, remember, it was defined at a point. Uh, namely at a specific value of x, 2, 3, 5, whatever, uh, and a function can be continuous at one point but fail to be continuous at another. And um, so what does it mean for a function to be continuous um, at on an entire interval of points? It just means it's continuous at every point inside that interval. Um, okay, good. So uh, the other thing we talked a lot about, uh, and I'm going to move on to a, a new sheet here in a second. Um, uh, oh, and also I realized that uh, I haven't set up the uh, the auto sharing for the chalkboard file. Um, I'll see if I can get that fixed this morning uh, for everybody. Okay, so. Um, the, uh, the next thing that we wanted to, to remind ourselves are were what it meant to have a max and a min. Okay, so uh, let me just kind of sketch this in pictures. Uh, if I have a function that's sort of like that, where is the local max? It's here. In this case, it's also global max. Um, so uh, let me actually extend this like that a little bit. And then this point here would be a local minimum, uh, but not a global minimum. OK, and I could draw other pictures here. So let me draw one that's sort of nice and smooth. Okay, so then in this case we have uh, max and then we still have a min. Okay, um, and we talked about how to find those things uh, when we were uh, all together in the classroom. Uh, we did a lot of it graphically, um, but in terms of calculus, where are the places that we're interested in that might be the locations of maxes and mins. So what's kind of the, what's the droid we're looking for, so to speak? We're looking for points where what is true. Ah, sorry, my handwriting is atrocious. Yeah, okay, find them. Um, yeah, when the slope changes sign, okay, so um, but Okay, so yeah, where uh, the derivative changes sign is basically the secret sauce that we're looking for, and um, the reason I include the um, um, uh, the possibility that f prime could be undefined is um, the um, uh, the situation where uh, well, for example, the first graph that I drew where I've got sharp corners, so the derivative is not actually defined at those maxes and mins, even though they're maxes and mins. Now, for most optimization problems, we really don't have to worry about the situation where the 
the derivative is undefined. Um, but we definitely want to be thinking about places where it's zero. Okay. Um, so next we can move on to a, a theorem. Okay, and this is called the extreme value theorem. Okay. Um, so if f of x is continuous on a closed interval a b then f of x achieves a max and a min somewhere oh, it would help if I could write sorry guys uh, somewhere on the interval from A to B. Okay, um, so sort of the graphical idea there, let me just sort of sketch a couple pictures, is so let's say that I'm restricting my X values to some interval, closed interval A to B. Then that means when I draw my graph, whatever it looks like, let's say it looks like this, okay, uh, and let me draw sort of another example, like let's just take a, a nice um, a nice parabola, something like that, okay. Um, so the, on a closed interval with a continuous function, that means that when I drew the graph, um, you know, sort of to use the high school definition of continuity, I didn't have to pick up my pen to do so. Um, and then, of course, we know what that means in terms of the limit definition. But notice what happened, that there's no way for this to work out where I don't actually have a maximum or a minimum. Okay, so both of these graphs, and of course, any other graph that I could draw that's continuous on a closed interval, would have this happen. Um, okay, so the question is, where do the max and min occur? Um, so how can we kind of think about that? I mean, looking at the graph, it's pretty obvious for each one where the max and the min occurs. Okay, uh, and so let me just, you know, notate on the picture here. Uh, we've got a max there, a max here, and then our two minimum points are here and there. Um, so where did the maxes and mins occur? I don't know what their x-coordinates are, but just sort of uh, in terms of the, the sketch, kind of what, where could these things occur? And I just realized that the clock on my iPad is wrong again. This is really weird because I fixed it. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's saying that. Yeah, it's somewhere in between A and B. Okay, and now I'm going to make a, um, a slight emendation to what you just said. Um, and this... What I'm going to say here is going to sound stupid, okay, um, because it kind of is. It either happens oops, um, they either happen at the endpoints or somewhere in the middle. Okay, and that's why I said it's kind of stupid, because, well, where else would they occur, <laughs> right? Um, it's it's either inside or at the ends. There's no other option, okay? Um, so that's maybe um, a stupid or obvious way to say it. 
Um, maybe a better way to say it is this. Okay, um, what is special about the places where this might occur between A and B? Um, in my example there, uh, those were places where the derivative was zero, uh, or better put, as, as we've discussed a second ago, it's the places where the derivative changes sign. So uh, it's not enough for the derivative to be zero, it also has to go from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing and sort of the the um, the reason for the changing sign bit so let me just draw another picture to kind of illustrate why we need that um, let's say that I had something like uh, this then um, this point right I'm going to use red for red herring this point right there the red one uh, is not a place. Um, well, okay. Let me actually redraw this because I've I've drawn a situation I really didn't quite want to deal with. Um, so I, I'm thinking of the graph of y equals x cubed here. So it should look more like that. Um, so let's say that we've got our interval here, a to b, and then the the point in the middle is there. So at that red point, um, at the red point there, the derivative is zero, okay, because we'd have a horizontal tangent line, but it's not a max or a min. So it's not enough to just look at where the derivative is zero. We have to eliminate anybody that doesn't also change, or, or, sorry, eliminate any points where the derivative isn't changing sign at that place. Um, now, in a lot of uh, practical uh, applications of this, it's not going to really matter. Um, we'll, you know, a lot of the problems that will work kind of, they work out nicely that we don't have to worry too much about the derivative doing funky stuff, but it could theoretically be an issue. Um, okay, so uh, are we Gucci with that? Um, so give me a shout out if that looks good to you. Okay. All right, looks good. All right, so let me pull up the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, sorry, it's taking a second to load here. Okay. Um, okay, so those were just a couple of uh, kind of quick review things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the next thing that we're going to start, and we'll need to continue this on Friday, uh, is optimization. Okay, so it's basically max min stuff plus a story problem. Okay, so like the related rate stuff that we did before, um, we had... Um, um, we had what was sort of a combination of implicit differentiation and um, uh, a story problem. Optimization that we're going to look at is going to be sort of similar. Uh, it'll be uh, finding max and mins, but where there's some sort of story attached to it.
Um, okay, so uh, let's uh, continue A. Um, so let's start with sort of a classic example of one of these. Okay, so suppose Um, let's suppose that I've got a hundred meters of fencing and I want to use that to enclose a rectangular garden. Okay. Um, how can I do this? And maximize the enclosed area. Okay, so kind of if you think about sort of the idea here, right, I could have like a long and skinny garden, or I could make it square, or I could make it sort of long in this direction. Um, and, you know, we could sit and draw these sorts of shapes all day. But the question is, which one of those is going to maximize the enclosed area, subject to the fact that I've got 100 meters of fence, and um, so I can't use you know as much fence as I want. I have to use this fixed amount. Um, okay, so um, so that's sort of the idea here. Okay, so what um, what do you think? We don't have a whole lot of information here, do we? Um, so let's draw a picture of sort of what our prototypical um, rectangle might look like. We don't know if it's going to be square or kind of rectangular this way, but let's just draw a picture and start labeling it. And let's say that it is x feet or meters this way and y meters this way. Okay, now if we look back to the statement of the problem, we literally are given one number and the word rectangle, um, and that we want to maximize the area. So how are we going to translate that into math? Okay, so what uh, translate the stuff that we've got into some sort of either equation or mathematical statement? Um, can I get a shout out from all the subscribers? Oh, looks like Evan, Evan Nichols, you joined us for some calculus this fine morning, didn't you? Um... Okay, yeah, so the area equation, um, so that's one piece of it, that the area enclosed by this object is equal to, um, well, what is the area of, that, of a rectangle? Area of a rectangle. What is that, Willie? Bueller. Yeah, length times width. And in this case, I chose to call the length x and the, the width y, so it would just be x times y in this case. All right, I'm going to give this equation a special name. That equation is what I'm going to call the objective function. All right, now Mr. Young is on to something. There's a second equation that we need. Okay, so you typed x squared plus y squared equals 100. 
Okay, so what were we trying to encode with that? So, like, where did you come up with the 100 and also the x squared plus the y squared? Okay, so y100 and y x squared plus y squared. Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry. So um, if, you, if you're not uh, looking at the, uh, the, the chat, um, Mr. Young suggested that we would also need this. Um, x squared plus y squared equals 100. So let's discuss that. Does the 100 make sense? Does the x squared plus y squared make sense? Okay, so where did all of that come from? Okay. So the 100 makes sense, and uh, the x squared plus y squared, uh, let's see, Nate, uh, Mr. Young says uh, it's multiplied together in an area problem, 100 from the total amount of fencing. Okay, so let's actually go back, though, and think about this. In terms of the rectangle that I drew here, um, so this rectangle here, let me kind of highlight the sides of it just for picture purposes. What is 100? In terms of the, the rectangle, is 100 the area of the rectangle or something else of the rectangle? So what's the word that we're looking for here uh, about the, the rectangle? Yeah, it's the perimeter. Okay. Now, is perimeter the same thing as area? <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, so what's the perimeter of the rectangle? So what's the perimeter of that rectangle in terms of x and y? Okay. It's 2x plus 2y. Okay, so let me cross that out here. So the reason that that needed to get crossed out is because it was mixing apples and oranges. So on the right-hand side of the equation, we have 100. Well, that's 100 meters, right? It's a length of things. On the left-hand side of that equation, x squared and y squared, well, those would be both be areas. It doesn't make sense to have an area equal to a length. They have two different units, okay? So what we need to replace that with is this. 2x plus 2y equals 100. Okay, that's kind of a subtle difference, right, especially if it's 8.30 in the morning and you haven't had your coffee yet. Um, okay, so does it make sense, uh, Mr. Young, why uh, we want this version, not the one that I crossed out?
Man, you guys are a real lively bunch this morning. What was the question? Okay. I was asking Mr. Young if it made sense why we needed to switch this from the equation I crossed out in red to the perimeter equation that's right below it. So I just want to make sure that makes sense to everybody before we move on. Makes sense to Matt. Mr. Young, are you good? Willie, it looks like you're good. Uh, what about guys in uh, Discord? Um, let's get a shout out to Austin Hughes, Commander Root, Mick Awesome 098, Odysseus Orion, Mr. Runyon, and Zach Feltz. Thanks for being subscribers. This is going to be a loot drop next time you play Fortnite or something. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so this equation that we've got, this one is called my constraint equation. Okay, and oh, okay, uh, Mr. Young, I'm sorry. Um, so let me just type. Um, okay, so um, most of these sorts of problems are going to have these two things, an objective function and a constraint equation, okay? And uh, then the question is, what do we do from here? Um, so let me rewrite these down here at the bottom just for, for sake of simplicity. Um, we have a of xy equals xy, and we had 2x plus 2y equals 100. Um, okay, so um, Um, so the problem with the area function, it's correct but it has two variables, x and y, and we don't know how to maximize or minimize things that have two variables, okay? So what we need to do is somehow get rid of one of the variables. And that's where our constraint equation comes in, because I could solve for x in terms of y or y in terms of x. In this case, it doesn't matter. I'll solve for y. And now that I know that y is 50 minus x, I can rewrite my objective as instead of being two variables, it now is just one variable, okay? So all I did there was I took this and I substituted in there for y, and now I have something that only depends on a single variable, okay, namely x. Now we're in business because we can throw the calculus at it that we normally do. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and multiply this out. And so we have 50x minus x squared. Okay, so we Gucci or Prada with that, uh, that step.
All right. So, now what should we do? Well, this being a calculus class, why don't we try taking a derivative? So, a prime of x would be 50 minus 2x. Okay, and we want to know, is a prime ever equal to 0? So, 50 minus 2x was our derivative. Let's set that equal to 0 and solve. And we end up getting x equals 25. Okay, so um, if x equals 25, then what's y? Well, we had a nice equation from before. We had that that we solved. And so, in this case, also, y is 25. Okay, so the conclusion Um, and I'll say for now, because I want to go a little deeper into this on uh, Friday, is that the, the best, or sorry, the field, uh, or sorry, the garden with maximum area is 25 meters by 25 meters. Okay. Now, if you think briefly, that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, so if we go back to the very beginning of this, where I was just kind of sketching some rectangles, the, the optimum turning out to be a square in this situation maybe wasn't totally shocking. Okay. Um, and that's kind of nice when, when things work out maybe the way you'd sort of expect them to work out. Um, Okay, but, uh, and so what I want to do on Friday is sort of ask, hang on a second, the dog is being ornery. Okay, so how do we know we haven't um, been duped? Okay, so we'll dig into some of the technical details as to why we know we genuinely have found the maximum here and that we haven't been stupid and stumbled on uh, some silly solution um, that we're just not noticing. Okay, um, so I wanted to spend the last um, five minutes uh, or so here just kind of talking a few business items. Um, so the first thing... Uh, is some good news for you guys. So, um, you know, what were we planning to do uh, this week? Maybe it even was today that I had scheduled it for originally. We were planning to do the old basic skills exam. And then the coronavirus happened. Well, that sucks. Uh, well, the coronavirus part anyway. So does the basic skills exam. So I've got good news for you. What are we going to do for the basic skills exam? Any brilliant suggestions or ideas? Basic 100%? Oh, you mean just give you all a hundred? Oh, I see how it is. Okay, nice try. Um, no, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, what you will, uh, yeah, Cameron. Cameron's on the money. We're just not going to do it. Okay. Um, so we're not going to do that. And uh, what this means is that I've got to basically rewrite the syllabus. Um, and. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking through that 
and kind of how to run the rest of the semester because the basic skills exam is a little bit hard to do if nobody is on campus, you know, because how do you do retakes and blah, blah, blah. And so basically I decided it's not that damned important um, for the class. Uh, now, uh, you guys probably wondered about the prerequisites exam that we never actually finished because I was horrible and lazy. Uh, for that, you all do get 100, so I tor tortured you through that. Um, yeah, we could do online exams, but honestly, like, it, we already are doing that. It's called Infinity, right? So why do something twice um, online? Uh, it just seems redundant at that point. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to kind of do is, um, we're going to shift a little bit and I'm going to do some projects, uh, kind of a, a project based approach with some stuff, uh, with you guys and that I think will be both more relevant to how you can actually use calculus to analyze the real world, but also it solves the problem of exams are just hard to do when everybody is you know you're at home and you might have screaming kids running around and and yeah so um anyway um we'll just not worry about the bse um okay so that's piece one of good news the second thing uh that i wanted to talk briefly about um based on my survey that i did of everybody um, on uh, the little Google form I set up, there was a lot of, um, uh, there was some discomfort with what would happen um, with grades, uh, particularly because, I mean, let's face it, calculus is a tough class, and it's even tougher when we can't all be in the same room together. Um, so yesterday, the faculty had an emergency meeting and uh, what we discussed was what to do about grading policies uh, for the semester. Um, an email will go out, or some sort of email will go out with all the actual details um, for, um, uh, to, to, to all students, okay? So this isn't just my class. Um, so pay attention to your email, but basically the TLDR is um, what we're going to allow everybody to do, uh, regardless of what year you are and regardless of how many credits you have and regardless of if you've used one of these before, is uh, we will allow uh, basically everybody to change the grade scheme for their class from the usual A, B, C, D stuff to CC or NC, so basically a pass-fail uh, approach. Um, so this is something that you could already have done uh, as a freshman, I think, or maybe early sophomore year once per semester, um, but for this semester, given all the craziness, we're going to allow um, everybody to do it um, for any classes that they choose. Um, now, don't all jump up at once and say you want to do this right now. There are some complications to it. You know, for example, it's not um, it's not appropriate in every situation. Uh, you know, if you're considering going to medical school or graduate school, then you might want to not choose the CC option. Um, so uh, it's something that you want to discuss quite thoroughly with your advisor. Um, and make sure that you're clear on all of the implications and all of the details to it. Okay, so um, I wanted to, to just sort of give you guys a quick preview of that. Um, and, um, <laughs> oh, thanks to Mr. or Dr. Denari E. Lobbied for a simple dartboard grading scheme. Yeah, so what's that? what that is is where you just take a dartboard and uh, you, you put, you know, A, B, C, D rings, and then you put people's name on a dartboard and you throw the dart, and wherever it lands, that's your grade. Yeah, 
Uh, no, we're not actually going to do that. Okay, so Zach uh, asks, would you be able to do this as this class applies to your major? Um, this semester, yes, you can. There's basically no restriction if it's for your major, if it's for your minor, if it's a pr uh, prerequisite for something, if it's a co-requisite for something. You can basically, it, it's sort of the Oprah Winfrey uh, policy for CCs. Everybody can use them if they want. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's not a whole lot of restrictions on it. Um, and the dates for how you declare this and, and with your advisor and a few other things like that, all of those details are going to go out in an email to all students. I would imagine that that will go out today, maybe tomorrow at the latest. Um, so, um, yeah. So, um, if uh, if this is going to be something like, uh, so Zach, for example, are you planning on doing uh, microeconomics, which is Econ 291, that has a calculus prerequisite um, of it, and um, you would um, you would be able to CC and still go on to econ. Uh, normally, that's not the case. Um, but under the circumstances this semester, we're going to sort of waive that. Okay, so Matt uh, asked, uh, will this count as one of the two allowed CCs? The answer to that question is no. Basically, uh, any CC this semester just doesn't count against the, the, the limit of two. So if uh, you were a freshman and you did one, let's say, last semester, and you CC something this semester, you still have one that you could use uh, in the fall, for example. Um, so anyway, um, I don't want to run too much over time. Um, uh, so I'll end the stream here in a second. But I did want to just kind of plug your ears that uh, this policy decision uh, was made, you know, basically 5.30 yesterday we voted on it. Um, and so the details will be sent, sent to everybody and... Uh, consult with your advisors. You don't have to make a decision on this today. Um, there is quite a lengthy time window that you can elect to do this. Um, and so uh, don't, you know, there's no need to contact your advisor today. You're not going to miss a deadline or anything like that. Okay, so just relax, um, read the policy when it comes out, and talk to your advisor. Um, okay, so we'll continue with the discussion on uh, Friday uh, of the optimization. We'll make sure that we actually have done everything correctly. We did, but I want to go through the technicalities to make sure that it's clear why this actually worked. Uh, and then we'll look at some spicier examples that uh, are a little bit more fun. All right, so thanks for coming, um, and uh, I'll see you guys on Friday.